Hi there, my name is Ruth Barton and I'm Head of the School of Creative Arts at Trinity College Dublin. The title of my talk uh, for this publication is Reimagining Irish Film Studies for the 21st Century. So Irish Film Studies stands at an interesting moment in its history. What was not so very long ago a brash new discipline that gatecrashed the more established subjects in art huma arts humanities is now undergoing its own challenges and identity concerns. In this country, as in others, questions are being raised as to its validity in the digital era, particularly now with the rise of, of the popularity of viewing platforms, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, and many more. And this is something that has evidently become even more pressing in the era of the pandemic. The other thing is the turn towards long form television nowhere more evident than in the lockdown phenomenon that was normal people. Of the 12 episodes of the series, the first six were directed by Lenny Abrahamson, particularly previously better known for his work in cinema. Adam and Paul, Garage, What Richard Did, Frank, The Multi-Award Winning Room, and The Little Stranger. Abrahamson had worked on television in the past uh, in collaboration with Mark O'Halloran, but few people saw Prosperity, the three-part TV series that he directed for RTE. And his reputation had been built so far on minutely observed arthouse fi films. He worked, he has, and, and continues to work, consistently with Element Pictures, whose own reputation has been cemented uh, by uh, its production of arthouse cinema. And I'm going to come back to that, one of their productions shortly in this talk. But when they made together, they made uh, normal people together uh, for TV, they suddenly found that they could make what was fundamentally an outhouse production, but one that was going to be seen in the first week of its release on BBC Three alone by over 16.2 million people, something that, that the makers of a small Irish film could never even dream of. So for the purposes of this essay, I want to look at, or to go back in time, and to, and to look at how Irish film studies developed and, and to start off with the work of its founding fathers. And I use the word fathers deliberately. So let's dive right back to the beginning and to the career, career of Liam O'Leary, uh, who uh, passed away in 1992. And we can see how this tradition starts as someone who, in his case, was a filmmaker, was an archivist, who worked for RTE, who worked for the British Film Institute, but also wrote books that advocated for the development of an Irish film industry. He also, and I've put it here, one of his key books was a biography of Rex Ingram, where he was making the claim that Ingram, who had always worked uh, in uh, the American film industry, although partly based in France, should be considered an Irish filmmaker. So it's a process of retrieval, but also an advocacy for the establishment of an Irish film industry, which was really only to start happening in the 1970s. The next and, and really very important publication that comes along is Cinema and Ireland, which was first published um, in, uh, in 1990. So Cinema and Ireland, uh, co-authored by Kevin Rockett, Lou Gibbons and John Hill was both a work of advocacy for the establishment of a national cinema, but also a look back at what had gone before. By now, a small scale, largely avant-garde filmmaking culture had come into being. And all of these shared um, a sense that this was the way forward for Irish cinema. Because when other filmmakers told our story, if you like, they did so out of other industries, speaking to other story, to other audiences, and often in ways that were uh, unrecognisable for those who uh, who were familiar with the Irish landscape. And of course, the prime uh, suspect in this is the Quiet Man. So in Cinema in Ireland, um, Kevin Rocket writes about the development of Indigenous Irish filmmaking, celebrating the avant-garde tradition. Uh, Luke Gibbons writes about uh, The Quiet Man, saying that we shouldn't see it really as a national embarrassment because it is a film that is meant to be taken ironically 
and he explores this further in his, his short monograph on the quiet man, where he looks particularly at the, uh, <clears throat> the, the tourism effect uh, that the film had. And um, I'm going to come back uh, to the troubles, but John Hill also at this point looks at, in, for Cinema and Ireland, he looks at the evolution of representations of the troubles and how different those trouble, how differently those troubles are represented from the perspective of American cinema and from the perspective of British cinema, arguing that in American cinema the tradition is that violence solves problems, whereas in British cinema violence is the problem. So these are key arguments that are, that are established by these three film by these three writers on film, and are developed in subsequent um, publications by all three. Um, Kevin Rocket also. Uh, in his Irish filmography, uh, began to to uh, create uh, a taxonomy of films made in and about Ireland by Irish filmmakers and by others. Then moving on, you have Martin McLoon, uh, Martin McLoon's publication coming in uh, on Irish cinema, which I've put here, where he begins to really introduce a more cultural studies perspective to Irish cinema, while also uh, arguing very much for a um, for determining what Irish cinema is as being other to mainstream cinema. So he he is arguing against the adoption of Hollywood uh, filmmaking techniques when creating a national cinema. Now, of course, all these writers were writing against the background of the Troubles, where the most pressing issue of the day was uh, the national question. But we also need to consider, too, um, the work of Brian McElroy here. M uh, McElroy comes in from a northern Protestant perspective, arguing uh, cogently that that perspective had been neglected um, in Irish uh, filmmaking, but also in the critique of Irish cinema. So as he argued, uh, the, the most sympathetic figure in most Troubles films is the Republican, and that loyalists are either not represented or unfairly represented. The other perspective then comes from John Hill, and um, who is unsympathetic to, to McElroy's arguments largely, though recognising, of course, that um, the Protestant perspective had indeed been underrepresented for reasons um, that are uh, too complicated to, to go into here. But what, um, as we move on in time then, what becomes evident is that you cannot have a national cinema that is purely produced in Ireland by Irish filmmakers for Irish audiences. The, financial, the finances are just not there. The film costs too much for a small uh, indigenous cinema to support itself and other funds have to be found. And here's where you get then the, the uh, start of a series of arguments about uh, transnationalism. And whereas before transnationalism, the process really by which filmmakers fund their products through resources culled from numerous different other producers in other countries, so any one film might be co-funded uh, by uh, producers across Europe and um, further afield. And so, so the struggle for the, for the Irish producer is to remain faithful to their Irish topic, while also uh, get, getting the funding that is required to make the film. For the earlier generation of film critics, this inevitably was a sellout, and the term Euro, pu Euro pudding was widely bandied about. But more recently, people have, have looked at, at the practice of transnational, transnationalism from uh, a, a perhaps a more evolved critical perspective, which is to say, Perhaps it isn't just the question of the centre dictating the periphery, but rather more that the periphery can speak back to the centre and even influence it. So in, in film terms, it isn't always that Hollywood dictates with its money how an Irish film looks, rather more that an Irish film can influence how Hollywood makes its, its, its cinema. And, and so that Irish filmmakers and Irish cinema can um, take the tools of Hollywood and craft uh, films that are still recognisably Irish. Of course, transnationalism also uh, 
led to the making of some really interesting films. And I've put here an image from The Lobster, perhaps one of the most interesting. And of course, Element Pictures, whom I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, are really at the centre of this. They have built up a reputation for very interesting transnational um, arrangements, and particularly their partnership with Yorgos Lanthimos, director of The Lobster. They also uh, produced his film The Favourite, multi-award winning and extremely pre prestigious for the company. So the point is, although there are losses, there are also gains within, within transnationalism and film criticism has had to catch up with that. In my own work, I've always been interested um, in looking at um, particularly the, the question of gender and representation, but also the interplay between um, film as, a, as, a, as an entertainment medium and how it speaks to the nation. So I, I don't argue that film mirrors the nation, but it is in dialogue with the nation. And um, I'm certainly not the only person to do it, but that is, that is what has, has um, really uh, influenced my two uh, major publications in the area, but also my work, um, which I'm going to come to in a second, on uh, the Irish, uh, Irish cinema as a diasporic cinema. But of course, the, the representation of women, when we start looking at this, we go straight back to The Quiet Man again, because it so much starts with The Quiet Man, and that is still one of the foundational texts of Irish cinema. But coming into the frame then, we have other writers, um, people like Debbie Ging, writing on uh, masculinity in Irish cinema, and Citizen Liddy's uh, edited collection, Women in the Irish Film Industry. And what's interesting about these works is that they are still works of advocacy. The writers, academics writing on Irish cinema still feel that they have a part to play in how Irish film is constructed. So they're not um, bystanders in terms of what they're writing about. They're participants um, in its future and how it should be shaped. But as I've said um, uh, earlier, and the point I want to end up with is that for most people writing on Irish cinema, it is not simply a local, a local film production uh, situation. It is a diasporic cinema created by people, uh, Irish uh, born, uh, emigrants, um, diasporic subjects, and, and non-Irish people around the world speaking to how the Irish um, have lived for so many years in uh, diasporic conditions. So, so it is really important to understand then that, that, that Irish cinema is not bounded by the national territory, but it is a global um, uh, practice, artistic practice. And so here I have Diane Negra's The Irish in Us as one of the key works um, on uh, diasporic Irish cinema. And in my own work, I've also looked at it, particularly with the edited collection, Screening Irish America. Um, the area that probably um, still is under-theorised uh, is, is Irish TV. I think, particularly with the success of productions like Normal People, there will be much more work coming out on, on it. But certainly going right back again, Lance Pettit in Screening Ireland uh, covered television. And, the, and there are increasingly, there are increasing and interesting publications on Irish TV. So where is it all going? Um, who knows? Um, cinema has been uh, written off too often for us to buy into that. Um, but certainly, I think, for those of us in the discipline, it is important that um, we open our eyes to the new developments and, and turn our critical attention to them. Thank you very much and enjoy the volume.